So cool, PowerPoint set up in French. This is awesome. <clears throat> Hi everybody, I'm David Rice. Uh, I'm going to present about an issue where I find that, I mean, often in uh, preserving audiovisual collections, uh, particularly like physical audiovisual objects like film and uh, videotape, <coughs> we have a lot of challenges and I want to point out that it might even be more challenges uh, than, we, than we realize. Uh, so, as a qu quick background on audiovisual objects, audiovisual objects will decay and deteriorate over time. The speed of that deterioration will be uh, dependent greatly on the format. Uh, for instance, like a 35 millimeter polyester print might survive well for, for decades uh, in the proper storage conditions, while a micro MV tape or a mini DVD or a mini DV tape might start to show loss and decay after uh, just a few years. <clears throat> uh, regardless of the format, the process of deterioration and decay is inevitable for uh, the physical objects that we work with. Um, as, as a way to um, fight back about su such decay, we uh, tend to reformat our objects by migrating them from one carrier to another. Uh, so this might involve copying like old umatic tapes onto newer digital beta cam tapes or uh, d digitizing a tape to a file, scanning a reel, copying a film print onto another film print, but it, it, we cannot rely on conservation alone to tr attempt to make these collections more permanent, but we have to migrate the content from old carriers uh, to new car carriers to offset uh, the decay. Beyond just the decay, there are issues where the, the formats that we are working with become obsolete by themselves. Uh, with di either digital or physical audiovisual collections, we need to properly maintain all the dependencies needed uh, to play back or to use those formats. Uh, so with uh, formats like this, you know, we would need a, 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 a beta deck, a, a mini DV deck, audio cassette deck, um, a lot of this hardware is uh, becoming more and more difficult to find, but in order to, to, in order to maintain the access to these collections, we need to maintain the machinery uh, in order to use them. <clears throat> as, as an example, uh, two, two decades of television history was often recorded onto Umatic tape. It's the first video tape format, if I understand correctly, that was uh, cased as a, in, a, in a shell. Um, the Sony uh, VO9850 deck was one of the most advanced Umatic deck uh, that was created by Sony towards the end of uh, the Umatic uh, era. Uh, but, and I, I should say that a few years ago, it did seem relatively easy to find these uh, decks. I could get onto Craigslist or eBay and find dozen of, dozens of production houses uh, trying to get rid of these machines. Uh, once I was tr uh, trying to buy some film rewinds from a production house in uh, Manhattan, and I saw some new Umatic decks there, the little, little, like nice looking Umatic decks there. And I, I said, what is happening with these? And he said he was taking them to the recycler tomorrow because they are worthless. Um, <clears throat> you know, I checked on eBay before coming here and there were only five of these uh, machines available. Uh, so we have this kind of issue where we have so much media to transfer, but so little equipment available. And it will just only be less and less equipment as we move forward. So the, the, the issue here is this, if we lose the equipment or the dependencies we need to play back this media, then we end up creating a physical object that's a bit like having a recording of a lost language. We might be able to uh, you know, preserve this recording and conserve it physically, but we won't be able to understand what it means or interpret how it was intended uh, to be used. So the maintenance of, of this equipment is an additional worry. More <laughs> pictures of Ben Turkis in our slides. Uh, so, um, you know, a, a few decades ago, these machines were just part of uh, video production, and there were a lot of people trained in maintaining them and providing those expertise. Uh, nowadays, these machines are not used in production at all. The, they are only really used in these kinds of preservation purposes. And as a result, the demand for sex, such expertise is lower, and the, the, um, you know, the, availab the availability of people to perform these services, to repair these machines, to keep them in working order, uh, after decades is, is getting harder to maintain. So on the other side, uh, when 
with digital players, uh, we, you know, we saw recently that VLC was uh, announcing that they had 2 billion downloads. I think it's uh, 2.5 billion or close to that at this point. Uh, so when I compare the, the five Umatic tapes, uh, five Umatic decks that are available compared to the potential 2 billion VLC downloads that have been sprinkled around the world, it's, it's uh, easy to see that it might be more sustainable to work with digital formats in the long run. Uh, for instance, I cannot uh, select my Umatic deck and hold down Control C and then Control V and have a second Umatic deck, uh, although I, I can do this uh, with VLC. So that, that's an introduction to the, the challenges that uh, audiovisual recording archivists face. But uh, the primary uh, issue I want to talk about is an, an additional challenge that we face, uh, which is about the, the software um, we use to facilitate digitization. Um, hang on a second, I'm trying to find the mouse on my screen. <clears throat> So uh, when I can say that like, I went to study audiovisual archiving in 2003 and 2004. When I graduated from there, I got my first job at Democracy Now!, a news program that um, mostly worked with digital tape, like DAT tape and mini DV tape. Uh, when I got there, I realized that in our fields, there is not much expertise in digital tape. Uh, there's a lot of expertise at the time in dealing with uh, preserving analog videotape and in a separate community, a lot of expertise in the digital preservation of files. But in this kind of middle territory of working with digital tape, where it's just a, a stream of data written on a tape, there was not a whole lot of expertise there to uh, rely upon. Um, at, th at the time, when I, st when I started working with these collections and trying to transfer these tapes to files, I would use a lot of the same tools that the production folks and the editors also used, like uh, tools like Final Cut 7, Live Capture Plus, Occasionally, somebody would be like, let's use iMovie to do this. But you know, there was a, a variety of tools that were, were commonly shared by both archivists and the, the creators of the video content uh, that we were collaborating with. <clears throat> so for the software that facilitates audiovisual digitization, I want to break it down into these four categories to kind of consider them a bit independently. Um, I mean, I mentioned uh, uh, Final Cut a bit earlier, but the, the four categories I generally see for uh, software digitization tools are software that's designed specifically for a particular tape format, like for, for mini DV or DAT tape, um, editing and production software like Adobe Premiere, Final Cut. Then there's, uh, I could probably name this better, but software accompanying hardware, um, and then open source projects. So to go into a software uh, for specific tapes, this, this is often the kind of software that falls the fastest into obsolescence. Um, so this is a, a, a picture of a, a Sony uh, Betacam SX tape. It was an early digital tape format, and it basically stores a, uh, a 422 encoding of an MPEG-2 stream so that this, this yellow tape you see here would hold about eight gigabytes of uh, an MPEG-2. It would be a little bit better quality than a DVD. Um, this was as a successor to the analog um, Betacam SP tape, but preceded the higher quality digital Betacam tape. Um, so with this Betacam SX tape, it's simply an MPEG stream, MPEG-2 stream written on the tape. Uh, so they developed this uh, editing system called the DNE 700, where it you would connect this computer to a Betacam SX deck, and then you could uh, transfer the MPEG-2 stream uh, to a computer edit it, and then transfer it back without encoding and re-encoding. You would just be uh, kind of copying portions of an MPEG stream uh, forward and backwards. Uh, so potentially, you could use this system to uh, help facilitate migrating the MPEG-2 stream from the tape into a file that you could preserve. But surprisingly, I cannot find any surviving DNE 700 system. I am skeptical that there are that many that existed in the, at the beginning. Uh, but you know, it's not a it's not really a feasible solution at this point to, to uh, try to work with such a system. Um, similar to uh, Betacam SX tape is uh, DV tape. DV tape are small tapes that are meant to be uh, cheap and small. Uh, they generally can record about an hour of D DV uh, in an encoding. And uh, back when I started in archiving, we used tens of thousands of DV tapes, and I was very well familiar with the, the software involved. 
Um, I used a lot of this project called Kino, which had a command line utility called dvgrab. And it was a command line tool where you could connect a DV camera to a computer via a FireWire cable, and dvgrab would help facilitate creating a file from the tape. So you could um, make like one new file per recording, get some logging of the transfer. Uh, but a few years ago, uh, they, uh, the developer announced that Kino is a, is a dead project because most of the community that used this project had moved on. It was only a few archivists left who were still trying to, to maintain it. Uh, I went to this website again when present, pre preparing this presentation, and uh, the, it was just a dead link at this point, so I had to get a copy from the Internet Archive. Um, and then also one thing is like when the project dvgrab became uh, dead, the forum was also locked. So uh, users could not ask additional questions or even kind of self-support. It's just uh, the, the central forum was, was closed. Uh, dvgrab is, is an open source project. Like it is feasible that somebody else could, could pick it up and continue. I think with uh, dvtape, it is something that we need to consider because uh, DV tape is not at all good at uh, lasting on the shelf. Uh, for the DV tape we have, it's, it's getting really imperative to transfer it. Uh, another DV software I wanted to point out was called Live Capture Plus. Uh, this was uh, a, a GUI-based application for transferring DV tape, and generally this would be the one I'd most recommend to other users because of its simplicity of, of use. Um, uh, about a year ago, I think, they, they moved uh, the company that makes Live Capture Plus called CatDV moved Live Capture Plus into their legacy section and uh, added this note saying that we will still support this. You can still, well, that we will still sell this. We will still take your money and give you a copy, but we will not give you any technical support. This is a legacy product. Uh, this is to be used at your own risk. Uh, you know, so then uh, we do what we do. We troll the company on Twitter. Uh, so we say, <laughs> Uh, you know, preservation of DV is really important. This is a pretty critical tool. Maybe instead of simply abandoning this project, you could consider uh, contributing the code to open source so other, others could pick up and, and build upon it. Uh, and then, you know, the, the result is even the legacy page of this company was then taken offline. Uh, so now, not only can you not get it not supported, you can't get it from the, the company that originally provided it. Um, there's several other pieces of software that I think fall into this category. There were a lot of command line tools for helping transfer DAT audio tape by moving the audio frames from the tape uh, to the, a computer using uh, DDS drives and other early data drives. Um, you know, but these have not been in development for over, over a decade probably in most of them. Um, but in, in general, these kinds of formats that are intended to support phys particular physical formats, these fall into obsolescence once it's likely that those formats aren't being used in production any longer. Uh, ar you know, archiving and preservation is such a small community compared to media production that we're uh, not enough of a, a voice or a need for many of these uh, products to be sustained. <coughs> uh, the next category of software is uh, editing and production software. Uh, so this is an image of Final Cut 7 back when it had a, an interface called uh, Login Capture where you could connect a video deck through a capture card to your computer. You could type in uh, start and end times and create uh, files. Uh, Final Cut 7 was based on a um, Apple um, audiovisual framework called QT Kit, a 32-bit framework. Uh, eventually, Apple rewrote their framework to create AV Foundation as a 64-bit framework. So uh, at that point, they ended up rewriting a bunch of their media tools, so uh, they uh, deprecated QuickTime 7, and then we had QuickTime X, and then similarly, uh, Final Cut 7 was deprecated, and we had Final Cut X. These applications were really uh, rewrites rather than new versions, so the features of the versions differed greatly. When they were writing Final Cut X, the, this interface to help facilitate digitization was not included in the new version. Uh, there's, I think there's like one remaining interface to facilitate a few types of like data transfer uh, from like XD cam cameras, but the, the login capture interface that we could use more flexibly like does not survive. <coughs> so this is a quote from an article from the New York Times on some of the complaints video editors had about uh, the upgrade to Final Cut X and all the missing features. So uh, I like that this one, <laughs> this one uh, reporter said, the complaint is that it cannot output to tape. Videotape is on the way out. You'd be hard pressed to find a camcorder that 
takes tape anymore, so it's not built into Final Cut X. Uh, this is one of several ways that Final Cut X is clearly a program designed more for the future than for the past, which is great, you guys. Thanks for forgetting about us altogether. Uh, even if videotape is not used in production anymore, we are holding decades and decades of this material and are in increasingly desperate need to transfer it. Uh, but some of the tools that we need for, for transferring it are falling out from under us. Uh, the next category, I'd say, is uh, software accompanying hardware. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the company Blackmagic Design a little bit. This is from their website uh, where they are selling a film scanner and presenting it in a very typical installation on how you would have a film scanner. Usually you want it at the bottom of the staircase, like so you can just... <clears throat> So, uh, so Blackmagic makes these devices to facilitate uh, transferring physical objects into digital files. So this is their one for, for their film scanner. In the back of the room, we have two uh, Blackmagic Ultra Studio boxes that can take multiple types of audiovisual input, like from component cables or SDI, and then output uh, an audiovisual stream. <clears throat> so uh, Blackmagic makes uh, this application called Media Express to help uh, facilitate the digitization. And it's uh, really kind of a, a, a proof of concept that helps show the features of their hardware without having uh, necessarily a more advanced application that, that can support and, su support and show that hardware. So this application uh, is not open source, but it is accompanying that hardware uh, free of charge. Um, but the, the design and the interface of this often kind of uh, compromises uh, digitization of it because a lot of the options are quite limited. Uh, it used to be that even though the hardware would support up to 32-bit audio, that it, the application that they provide you only would support 16-bit. Uh, uh, I think now if you select that you want 10-bit video, it will give you 24-bit audio, uh, even though it doesn't necessarily tell you what it's doing. Um, another issue is here, like you can see at the, in the bottom, there are some the person is selecting four audio channels, but these channels all get mi mixed into one four channel track. Uh, so for instance, if you have like a, a videotape where the first two channels are a presentation in French, and then the second two channels are a presentation in, in Spanish, they would all just be a concaphonous part of a single audio recording uh, when it comes out. Um, often like when we're digitizing videotapes, we need to kind of clarify the, the intent of different elements of the recording. Uh, but but live capture plus you are a bit limited into how you can you can do this. Thanks. So Blackmagic, good news. They have a developer SDK, and uh, on their on their website they say that you can uh, use this to make software in house or even to sell. So this is great. We'll use the SDK. We'll save everything. Uh, when we go into the SDK, the files give a very uh, open license. This is a boost license, which is. Um, similar to the MIT license. However, to get the SDK, you have to agree to an end user license agreement that restricts your ability to share or copy the SDK. And then, uh, you know, one of our guests today, he decided because of this, he would add in a patch to FFmpeg to say if you build FFmpeg Viv, the, the Decklink SDK, that that FFmpeg will be marked as non-distributable, so it is not permissive to share it. Um, I recently had some emails with Blackmagic about the conflict between having an open license in the SDK but then a restrictive agreement to access it. And they were saying that their intention was more so that um, you can use the SDK to build a tool that is open source and under, under the more open agreement, but you cannot distribute the SDK it, itself. Um, I think this is something that's not completely clear from their site. Uh, uh, similar to Blackmagic, the company Aja also makes a, a utility called Control Room. Uh, they also have an SDK, but if you would want to read it, you have to fill out this financial credit application, provide your references, talk about how much money you're making from audiovisual preservation so that you can become a partner. It's, uh, you know, and so we do what we do. We get back on Twitter and we start trolling the company right away. Uh, in this case, instead of just pulling down the whole website, uh, Nick Rasby, the president, uh, you know, en engaged with quite a few of us on, on Twitter, and uh, in the upper right, he kind of concludes by saying their CTO is on board and they're getting ready to do this. <clears throat> so the last option, I'll go through this quickly, is the open source one, which I think is really 
uh, where we have to invest and innovate the most. Uh, this is a picture again from uh, uh, Bayvac in San Francisco of an implementation of uh, vRecord. Um, vRecord uses uh, a few different tiles to show uh, tools like waveform and vector scopes, you can calibrate your uh, playback. It gives statistics. It gives these kind of like indicators if your video is too dark or too black. Um, <clears throat> so the components of vRecord currently are, this is a project in GitHub. It uses the Blackmagic SDK. It uses uh, BMD tools, um, which helps facilitate a connection between the SDK and piping it out to a, a subsequent tool like FFmpeg or libav. In, uh, VRecord, we then use FFmpeg to uh, record the file to the settings we want and then to make the visualizations. Uh, for some future upgrades, I think potentially we could swap from using BMD tools to using FFmpeg compiled viv uh, decklink and consider using uh, MPV instead of FFplay to make more dynamic and interactive uh, displays. Uh, also, just being able to, to make our own scripts to control digitization, we can add in a lot of things to support our work. So here we're using Cowsay to report on uh, how many frames exceed the saturation levels that are set for our threshold. Other opportunities we have a vRecord are to add in like uh, custom derivatives, uh, you know, more logging, and also to help select uh, tools that, or encodings that support preservation, uh, whereas most digitization software is set to support production. Uh, so for instance, trying to use something like FFV1 or JPEG 2000 in digitization software in most of the other tools is almost never going to happen uh, because they are focused on making H.264 ProRes, like production formats, uh, you know, not necessarily looking for the same criteria that, that archivists would use in selecting uh, lossless codecs. And I'll skip ahead a bit, but vRecord is on GitHub, and I will take questions and then end it. But thank you for coming in. No time to wait. Yeah. <laughs> So, any questions? Um, I'm probably not going to get to you, so I'll repeat the question. <clears throat> no, you, you go first. As I understand it, a VRecord is only for Mac at the minute, is that correct? Or can any apply to the Windows version? Yeah, it's, it's true. Uh, just I to repeat the question. Um, it's, oh. it's just checking if VRecord is only available for Mac. Yes, uh, I mean, for, for Windows, so far my, my Windows experience is, is limited to trying to check my email at my parents' house, uh, so I, I don't uh, necessarily have as much ability to develop there. I think uh, one limiting factor is uh, BMD tools, which is currently used to connect the, the SDK and the FFmpeg, is only developed for Mac and for Linux. But I'm not even sure if Linux uh, if vRecord would work because the development testing has only been in Mac so far. Uh, Retrochromer might have some more. Yes, he already has his hand raised. But, uh. <laughs> it's, it's possible to run it on Linux and on the Linux subsystem on, uh, on uh, Windows 10, but it's a little bit tricky, so it's uh, still not released. But I hope that in or three months it will be released. Yeah, and I didn't mean to just uh, highlight vRecord alone. Like there are other open source projects we'll hear about in this, in this recording. This is a screenshot of, of DVA uh, profession, like another open source tool to help facilitate digitization. I mean, I think a lot of these projects are worth while supporting and contributing to and testing. I think we probably have time for one or two more questions. Uh, Jerome. Jerome Martinez. Not a question, but if there is some need to port something to other OS, uh, this is doable, this is not difficult because it is open source. So No, uh, sorry, Jerome, we said <laughs> questions. Okay, yeah, yeah, like just saying <laughs> <laughs> it is doable, so it is open source. All right, if anyone so. has any questions about what else Jerome can do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Michael Lobenstein. Dave, one, one last question, not relating to, to uh, software solutions and capture, but going back to the hardware. Um, are there any initiatives that, you're, that you know of where hardware that is available, like second-hand hardware, or even the knowledge or documentation where particular capture hardware is actually capped and maintained and where the skills are? Yeah, to actually I, operate the equipment existing. I'm just saying because in the film world, we've had a conversation over the last 
two years of micro labs springing up and people trying to reverse engineer film stock and chemistry mm -hmm. and collecting lab equipment. But I don't know of any of these activities in the in the um, space of videotape, maybe because videotape has always been the dirty little cousin. I don't know. No, I think uh, there are many archives that, that follow eBay and Craigslist and try to hoard what they can save. Uh, particularly, you know, because in, in general, like an archive should try to maintain enough hardware to make it possible to transfer their collections. If they have tens of thousands of Umatic tapes in one deck that maybe has, you know, it's, it's not going to have the lifetime necessary to transfer it. Um, but also in relation to hardware, I'd say like, I'd, uh, I asked when I spoke to the Black Magic company on the phone, I asked like, for how much longer do you think you'll be selling these tools that we're using? Because I think at some point we'll be ending up in the same situation as we are with Umatic decks. We'll be searching through eBay to try to find a Black Magic Ultra Studio deck to, to facilitate the parts. And then we'll be trying to recreate a 2017 era computer so that we can, we can do this work. Just, just a, a comment to that. I, I think Blackmagic is a good example of companies who embark on new business ventures, for instance, with the Sintel film scanner, yeah. without actually considering archival needs. So when, when I worked in Australia, I actually we worked with Blackmagic in developing the Sintel scanner, and they were actually surprised that any audiovisual archives would use it, because for them that was just for footage libraries. I, know, so I, they, I assume this was an, taken in an archive, yes? That's right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That is, that is pretty much indicative. You don't really have to explain it any further. But um, it's, uh, I think it's about an ongoing dialogue, not only among not-for-profits and larger government archives about who stockpiles what, but also talking to, talking to um, hardware manufacturers and actually informing them better of our needs. Like, for instance, when talking to Blackmagic, Grant Petty at one point leaned back and said, so, so you think there would be an application for actually trying to interface with a two-inch deck? And he'd never thought about that because like two inch for him was like 30 years in the past and his apprentice years. Yeah, uh, this is partly why trolling these companies on Twitter is a worthwhile tactic, uh, you know, to make our voice known on Twitter or the social media trolling platform of your choice. Uh, <laughs> cool. yes. Thank you so much, Dave. Yeah, thank you.